Well, good day. Been a while since I've seen. Or since you've seen. Yeah, I'm not actually seeing you yet. One day we'll meet up, that's for sure. Anyway, welcome back to my channel. I'm um, going to do a bit of brewing. Actually, no, I've done the brewing. I'm going to do a bit of bottling. And I've perfected. Perfected. I've improved upon my system. And you get to see it today. Tonight, actually, it's already bloody. Just don't tell me how bloody late it is. I'm ashamed how bloody late it is already. It's bloody late, alright. It's like nearly or beyond, I don't know, 8 o'clock ish. I haven't eaten all day, but I have had several good healthy beers, so it's okay. I've had my nutrients because this is a, um, that's a Cooper's. Cooper's are full of nutrients, lots of vitamin B's and other good stuff. So, so there's been so many things I wanted to make videos about for such a long time now that, that I've actually, um, kind of lost the interest, you know, there's just like so much, so much I want to say, so much I want to get out there. Hang on. Yeah, let's undo that one. Open the airlock. Now air can enter. And here's the sugar syrup. I actually made this last week. So yes, this beer is well and truly overdue for bottling. It's a 60 litre drum, so 50 litres of brew to bottle. So this, naturally, I actually added a little bit of this new bicarb of soda that I bought the other day at the health food store. Because it's the aluminium free one. I thought, well, if I'm going to be adding a little bit of bicarb of soda to my coffee every morning. Might as well get some bloody aluminium free one. Yeah, we've got enough aluminium on our brains already. That's why we're all getting so demented. Not to mention what they're spraying in the skies. And all those freaking chemtrails. Yeah, I hope that will stay in place. Because this should speed the um, process up a little bit. Rather than have to take every bottle out of the box, like so, and go, oh, that's right, we have to pump the, pump it full of syrup first. Oh, there's the first bit. More air bubbles. So yeah, we're having to sway. <laughs> have to take every single bottle out and do this every single time. I think we only have two pumps to the long necks. What I thought I'd do. Uh, I still had to take them out to tap them. I really thought this through, you know. Don't you couldn't worry. <laughs> anyway, here's one I prepared earlier. I know. I've got two beers going at the same time. That's what happens when you're me. This is one I made. That was one Cooper's made. 
Let's do a taste test. Coopers do still win at this point in time, but the competition's not over yet. I'm only 46 years old, for fuck's sake. They've been doing it for hundreds of years. So what we can actually do, duh, is do the bottling in the box. Let's just get the first one started because it's hissing at me like a cut snake. This siphon started. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not happy with that because you can't see when it's full. So we live and learn. Now, I've been inundated, voluntarily of course, with fucking globe tards on this. Facebook page calls itself something like hey, okay, um, the original flat earth first globe tard argument page or something oh, debate debate page <laughs> so Yeah, no, it's stupid of me to waste all my time doing this, but I just find it fucking fun. <laughs> I mean, I used to just go to atheist pages all the time just to find some angry, angry atheists. Because, I don't know, when you're me, right, I won't. No reason to mock people's beliefs. Unless they're globe targets. I, I just think it's... It's wrong to mock somebody's beliefs, which they were handed down for generations. And they fully believe. And, you know, just don't mock it. Prove a different thing if you like. You know, talk a different um, different concept, different idea, just anything to help make them question it for themselves. I mean, the only way in any sort of enlightenment occurs is when the student has the aha moment. The teacher can only point them in the direction, but can't make them think. Doesn't work that way. You can just say, here's all the information. Drink it in. Go learn for yourself. And when you get a bit of maturity under your belt, you might start to learn to think for yourself. But the trouble with globe-headed, indoctrinated fuckwits, which is what this particular one operating under a false name, or, you know, a soft puppet account anyway. But he's a fuckwit and he knows it. And he's been getting rude and calling me names, so... I got no problem fighting fire with fire. But it's what happens when you're an indoctrinated fuckwit. You have no ability to think outside of your indoctrination. You can't even entertain a notion for a moment. But you can fully believe in your head that your concept of reality is real. So here's one to fuck you all up, all you globe head believers who are using proof of star rotation 
going anti-clockwise in the north, going clockwise in the south. Up in the north, all the stars will rotate around Polaris. If you align your camera precisely with Polaris and look at the stars going that way, you'll see them make perfect circles around Polaris. And then the argument then from the globe tards is that the same thing happens in the south around Sigma Octantis. Finally learned how to say that because I've been living here in the south most of my life. The majority of the 46 years that I've been here so far and Sigma on Octantis, I've never seen it. It doesn't stand out to me. Apparently it's a very dark star. People like dark matter, I suppose. But they've shown time-lapse video where it seems to exist and looks as though it does the same thing, or the stars do the same thing around it as they do around Polaris in the north. So... All you globe believers, here's a little experiment for you to do and get back with the results because I guarantee you, you will get a fail in this course of Proveture, of Globature. Okay, so here's your experiments. Take yourself your model globe earth you know that the one that you've been indoctrinated with since you were a little kid or you know get a beach ball get the biggest ball you can find because it takes big balls to believe in big lies so get your biggest ball you can find but you're going to have to find a way of spinning it that's why I suggest just use a model globe because it, it's already got things through the poles. North Pole and South Pole to make it spin. As you believe. Are you with me so far? Good. So you've got yourself a ball. Get one that you can hang from a string if you like. So, so it can spin around. That way you won't have a south pole getting in the way of your camera because you're going to need two cameras or one I recommend two get two or three get as many cameras as you f feel like doing <laughs> yes save myself from fucking swearing get as many fucking cameras as you like but at least get two. Put one in the north pointing up at your Polaris. Put one in the south pointing down at your Sigma Octantis. Do some time lapse as you spin your globe, spin your ball, spin whatever magical spinning ball thing you believe in and show how all the objects around the room are going to spin around in perfect circles from whatever object your camera's pointed at while it's spinning around on a ball. Okay? You can make believe you're on a spinning ball with your simple understanding of how sunset and sunrise and all that works. That's very simple because... That's the first thing you think. Oh, well, we're on a spinning ball because the sun rises and sun sets. So on a spinning ball. Okay, good. That's the first thing most people ask when they get introduced to the flat earth. We can explain that with perspective and visibility and distance and all the rest. But let's go back to our stars again. Two celestial poles... Two cameras on a spinning ball. Both of them at the same time. Pointing at the same 
opposite direction, gathering perfect circles from different places all over the globe. And that's your proof we're on a spinning ball. Do the experiment, show me how that works. Put your fake stars up in a room, do it in a friggin' stadium, make your spinning ball as big as you like, two cameras on it, pointing at a fixed point at the same time, making perfect circles of objects in the distance, and you fail every single time. You cannot do it. It proves beyond any unreasonable doubt, any reasonable doubt, that the Earth is flat. So yes, I do get asked then, how do I explain the stars? I've explained the stars before. I've, I'm like the um, drinker, hang on. I'm like the most enlightened thinker as to how the stars work. Most people like to go back to their biblical beliefs and say they're fixed in the firmament and spin around us. I don't buy that. Not for one second. I don't know if there is a firmament. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. It does make sense that the stars appear to be sonar luminescence so that they're glowing and shimmering and changing colour and all looking roughly the same size from billions and billions and zillions of light years away. What I think the stars are, I've said it before, I think they are truly the departed souls of enlightened human beings who came here to Earth and became enlightened. They learnt the truth of why we're here, what we're here for. They did great works, they did great advances in humanity, and they earned their seat in the heavens, where they sit permanently as their celestial families slowly come and join them. That's just, it's not a belief, it's an idea, which I think has merit. And the reason I think that is because why else would they be there? The whole concept of the choirs of angels, choirs, singing, singing, sound, sona, luminescence. Sona luminescence makes sense for why the stars are there. The same stars that we see every night of the year, year after year, in the same place. If we were going around the sun through the galaxy, they would not only be changing place constantly, they'd be changing parallax, they'd be changing so many different things if you could apply a little bit of critical thought to them. But indoctrination makes you think, eh, hey, well, it's the... I don't even want to go into the indoctrination at the moment. It's just so ridiculous. And I've got beer to bottle here. So, why do the stars then appear to rotate counterclockwise around Polaris, clockwise around Sigma Octantis? And I think that's a very worthy question. I, if I've got time, I'll even go into the eclipses. In fact, let's let's start with the eclipses. Why not? The eclipse of the sun, a solar eclipse, is when the moon passes in front of the sun and blocks it out, and we can't see it. And the reason you don't see the moon during those times is because it's a new moon. Whenever a body of anything is so close to the sun, you can't see it because the sun's light is too bright. Okay, it's not the hardest thing to comprehend. The reason you don't see stars in the daytime is because the sun's light is too bright. As soon as the sun has gone sufficiently far enough away, the stars appear. 
exactly where they've always been. Because the sun is too far away and its light isn't so bright. It's the same thing with the moon. If you're looking at a, a near new moon, you will see that you can't see it until just after sunset. And then, just after sunset, or as I like to call it, sun sufficiently far enough away, because it's travelling across, you will see the sliver of crescent moon and you will see the entire dark part of the moon, which people say doesn't exist because you can't see it in the daytime. Of course you can't see it in the daytime because the sunlight is too bright and drowns it out. But the bit of moonlight that we can see is sufficiently bright enough to pass through all that atmosphere so we can see it. You do not see stars through the moon. Mm -mm. You are seeing the dark part of the moon after the sun has gone down and the light is sufficient for that to occur. So, when we get a solar eclipse, that is when the moon is so close to the sun, it is perfectly new. And that's the one rare occasion it passes between us and the sun. And we get a solar eclipse. The lunar eclipse, on the other hand, is a bit trickier. I will grant you that, but I've been studying this one for a while too. And I know it just sounds a little bit far-fetched to believe in a second celestial body. If you look around for long enough, looking at various pictures of sunsets and YouTube videos people have taken, you will find that quite often you can see what looks to be a second sun at usually sunset because it's normally hidden by the sun once again because it's what we call the black sun commonly known as Rahu R-A-H-U and it hangs around the sun most of the time and you can't see it it's too close it's dark sometimes at sunset it will reflect sunlight just as the moon does and you will see what looks like, like two suns. And you'll be like, holy fucking shit, what's the fuck? Nibiru? No, it's not Nibiru. It is Rahu. It is the dark sun that hangs around it. And once in a while, once in a while, it too will pass between the sun and the moon and give us a lunar eclipse. Believe me, I've looked at lunar eclipses in the flesh and the way the shadow comes across it from the perspective as we should understand if the sun was going behind us and the earth's shadow is coming up from behind to go in front of the moon the the shadow should come perfectly from the bottom up and hide it but no it comes from the top right hand corner and comes across as an angle the only thing that can explain that is a second celestial body between the sun and the moon blocking the sunlight from hitting the moon. So therefore, Rahu is the cause of the lunar eclipse. Uh, need to take a breath here. Let me pause for two seconds. Okay, well I've got maybe five or six minutes left. I'm just going to stop on the beer for a second and get back to the stars and why they appear to rotate around Polaris towards the center of their flat earth and why they appear to rotate around Sigma Octantis towards the south of our flat earth. Now if you know anything about exploration of Antarctica you will know that there are many, many, many recorded instances of people somehow breaking through the ice wall during times when the melt was sufficiently great or flying over it somehow and finding other continents beyond Antarctica. Admiral Byrd was one of the most respected 
um, authorities on this subject. And he talked about a continent as big as the size of the continental USA beyond Antarctica. Not, not behind the ice, but many, many other thousands of miles beyond. So the theory I'm working with when it comes to the rotating stars and the other continents beyond Antarctica is, is, is it all makes sense if you can comprehend it. Every single one of these other worlds. Now think about the word worlds for a second. W-O-R-L-D-S, worlds. What about W-H-I-R-L-E-D-S, worlds? Whirly-whirlies. Worlds within worlds. <laughs> worlds without worlds. Worlds beyond our known flat Earth. Worlds beyond Antarctica. There are multiple, multiple, multiple other continents beyond possibly expanding into infinity, which is the universe explained. The universe is the bottom, or the physical universe, is the bottom of existence. And it goes forever and ever and ever, and there is no end. That is how it works. So our stars in our heavenly body, spinning around what we call Polaris, have you also noticed how all our supermen come from the North Pole? Santa Claus, Superman, they all live in the North Pole. There's something special about that for some reason. But then when we get further away to the south, they start going the other way. Well, that's probably because these other continents also have their own suns. Why wouldn't they? If you think that we can have them in the galaxial open space world, why can't we have them on the infinite flat plane world where there's other suns with their own celestial bodies of ancient familiar ancestors watching over them and guiding them. And so as you go even further, the next one might go back the other way again. Why wouldn't there be constant worlds of worlds and stars watching over every living place on the infinite flat plane? Why wouldn't they? I mean, the idea of a spinning ball in a vacuum. I'm sorry. It bears no relation to any physical known laws of science and physics that we can understand observe, repeat, do experiments and so on. Experiments. If you're doing experiments on water in a vacuum chamber, it boils instantly. When you unlock the vacuum chamber, atmosphere rushes in to fill it straight away. When you put clothes in a spin dryer, it spins the water out and the heat makes it evaporate. So you put all that together on a spinning ball in front of a sun, all our water instantly boils, our atmosphere dissipates into the nothingness of the vacuum, and we look like we live on the surface of the moon. We cannot be on a spinning ball in a vacuum of space just by those very basic, simple facts of science, which you globe heads refuse to accept, refuse to understand. You think water can curve because of gravity. But you've never seen or shown or proven a single example of that. We can see on any physical object, water drips off, falls down, finds its level, until it gets contained within something with higher edges, which for us here on our part of the physical infinite flat plane is surrounded by the Antarctic ice wall. Whatever is beyond that, we're forbidden to see 
at this stage. But the more we question, the more we ask, and the more we push for answers, the sooner we will find out. But the more, more you globeheads keep insisting upon we're fucking ignorant flat tards with no idea of reality, the longer it will take. Wake up to reality and look at the truth. Do you feel a thousand miles spinning? Do you? Have you ever jumped up onto the roof of a speeding train that's moving like not even 200 miles an hour and tried to throw a ball from one to another? But you believe fully we're on an open air planet moving faster than a thousand miles an hour and we feel nothing. Globetardism is the worst religion ever. Flat Earth reality is bringing us back to our knowledge of who we are and why we're here. See ya.